So today we're talking about a couple of parables that Jesus told about the value of things. I don't know if you've ever had this experience, but I inherited a ring from actually quite unexpectedly from an elderly relative. And when I looked at it, I had no idea what it was worth. I'm not an expert in, in rings. So I took it to get it valued. And the expert was able to tell me, you know, this is the value. But then I said, if I asked, I didn't want to do this, but if I was to offer it to you to buy, what would you pay for it? And interestingly, that number was actually quite different from, it's quite a bit lower than um, the number that they said is the value. And I'm sure if you've ever had jewellery valued, that would be your experience as well. So to really know the value of things, we need to ask an expert. But to truly know the value, we need to know what the expert would be prepared to pay for that item. So let's look at what Jesus had to say. So we're looking in Matthew 13, 44 to 46. And he said, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy, he went and sold all he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. So simple parables. As parables are very situational. They were written that when Jesus told them, he told them for the, those people at that time. So to understand it well, there's a few, a little bit of background information we need. So the first one is the kingdom of heaven. We've talked about this before, but I just thought I'd mention the kingdom of heaven is wherever God rules. So as Christians, we live in the kingdom of heaven because we have said that God is the king of our life. And when we move out into the world and we bring his light and his love, we take the kingdom of heaven with us. So Jesus was telling us stuff about the kingdom of heaven. Another thing is you might think, well, why would anyone find treasure hidden in a field? You have to understand that Israel was a country that was frequently at war. If you, when you read the Old Testament, you can see that, how over and over again, different people attacked and there was no real banks or anything. What you had was, you had to, it was the physical coins, the physical treasure. So if there was an enemy coming and you had this bag of gold, you could take it with you, but there was a risk of being captured and having it taken from you. So it was a common thing for people who had wealth for them to bury it. The trouble was there's been a war. They might have been killed. They might have come back and the tree that they buried it under or the town that they buried it near had been destroyed. So they may never have found it again. I don't know if I buried something in my yard, I'd probably have trouble finding it. You know, it's not a, if the landmark goes, it's easy to lose it. So finding buried treasure is not an uncommon thing in, in the world of Israel. I mean, it's obviously rare. It's exciting and amazing, but it's not like we would be very surprised if we found buried treasure, whereas it was something that was in the realms of possibility in their world. The other thing is pearls. We think, you know, pearls are nice, a bit old lady, but, you know, they're lovely. But if I said to you, what's the most valuable jewel, we would think of diamonds, wouldn't we? It's di my book, Diamonds from the King. But in the ancient world, pearls were the most valuable jewel. And it kind of makes sense. If you think of trying to cut a diamond with or any other stone with the tools that they had at that time, they couldn't cut them amazingly like we could. So I, I remember being in Europe and seeing medieval crown jewels and they were, the, ju the actual jewels were quite dull because they couldn't cut them with precision. Whereas a pearl is stunning, you know, like a pearl glows and shines and particularly a beautiful, perfect pearl. But they had no way of producing pearls. The only way to find a pearl was to go diving and open up oysters. And so a perfect round pearl was beyond price almost. There was a Roman bloke called Pliny the Elder 
and he called pearls the choicest and most rare and unique products of nature. And he told the story of Cleopatra, who said to Mark Antony that he would give the most, she would give the most expensive banquet ever for him. And he thought, well, how are you going to do that? So what she did was she took the pearl, took this incredibly valuable pearl that Pliny said was worth 15 million denarius and dissolved it in um, vinegar and swallowed it. So you might go, 15 million denarius, what's that mean? So a denarius was one day's pay for a labourer or a soldier. So if you were a, um, a day labourer, that would mean you'd have to work seven days a week for 41,000 years to buy this pearl. Very valuable pearl. I worked it out too, if you look at Australia's minimum wage of 154 per day, the pearl would cost 2 billion 316,000 million dollars. So 2,316 2, 2, million. So pearls were very, 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 very valuable. So when Jesus used the pearl as an example, he wasn't sort of talking about the cultured pearl that you can get down the road for $50. He was talking about something of unbelievable value. So having given you that information, let's look at the first one. So the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. So probably this man was working in the field. We don't know, but somehow he stumbled across a treasure in his everyday life. He wasn't a treasure seeker. He wasn't going out with his um, metal detector looking for treasure. He was someone going about his everyday life and he came across a treasure. Just imagine. We've read about this in England, you know, farmers ploughing their fields and they find a Roman hoard. So he, he starts to look at it and then he realises it's not his. If he took this treasure, he would be stealing. So he quickly covers it up. He doesn't examine it properly. He quickly covers it. And then he goes and thinks, what can I do? How can I get this treasure? And he thinks, well, if I sold everything, I could probably buy the field. So he goes and he sells everything he owns. He sells his cooking pots. He sells his clothes. He sells his bed. He sells, I don't know what a day labourer would have, but he sells every single thing he owns. His neighbours must have thought, he was mad. And then when he collected all the money he could get, he went to the owner of the field and made an offer. Here, look, would you, can I give you this money for your field? The man goes, oh, well, I guess. It's just a field. The owner has no idea of the value there. But it presumably wasn't his, otherwise he would have known the treasure was there. So, so the man pays everything he has to buy a field. But it's not a field that he wants, it's a treasure. The treasure is worth infinitely more. We don't know. He doesn't say what the treasure is worth, but the treasure is worth far, far, far more than the field. The man, day labourer, working a denarius a day, could never have earned enough money to buy the treasure. But he could earn enough to buy the field. So the, the treasure was like, a, it was like a free gift. But the, he had to give up something to get the field. So I think that this treasure is talking about us entering the kingdom of God. It says the kingdom of God is like a treasure. We cannot buy our way into God's kingdom. We can't be good enough. We can't. Going to church doesn't bring us into God's kingdom. Having Christian parents doesn't bring us into God's kingdom. There's nothing that we can do to earn God's kingdom. But entering God's kingdom does cost us. The man couldn't ever buy the, the treasure. His parents couldn't leave it to him by inheritance because presumably they also were poor. But by giving up everything he had, he could buy the field. And it's like that for us. If we want to enter God's kingdom, it's free, but it costs us. It's a bit of a contrast. Because you can't say, Jesus, I want you to be the boss of my life. I want to live your way and change nothing. Your life, when you become a Christian, 
your life radically changes. So it's this contrast of freedom, and yet there is a price. So that's the first, first parable. The second parable... Oh, sorry, I forgot to say some things. <laughs> I should look at my notes. So Jesus said, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? So yeah, Jesus said it, it does cost us to enter his kingdom and yet what we get is so much more than what we give. God offers us abundant life. The treasure was an abundance. It wasn't what he gave was he didn't give everything for nothing. He gave everything for far more than he could imagine. And it's like that when we enter God's kingdom, we enter into abundance. We enter into joy. We enter into what we're made for. C.S. Lewis, I love this quote from C.S. Lewis. He says, The Christian way is different from trying to be good. It's harder and easier. Christ says, give me all. I don't want so much of your money and so much of your work. I want you. Hand over your whole self, all the desires that you think are innocent, as well as the ones that you think are wicked. The whole outfit. I will give you a new self instead. In fact, I will give you myself. So when we give up our broken lives, what we get in exchange is Jesus. What we get in exchange is, is just so valuable. So the next part of the next parable is the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. So this one says the kingdom is like a merchant. So the merchant would be quite rich probably. Well, he's obviously very rich. He can buy a pearl of great price. And he is travelling, looking, looking for the best pearls. He's an expert in pearls. He knows about pearls. And when he sees this pearl of great price, perfectly round with a stunning luster, the most amazing pearl he's ever seen, he is prepared to sell everything he has to buy that pearl. The day labourer, when he sold everything he had, he sold some clothes, some cooking equipment, a bed, a chair. The merchant who is buying a fine pearl sold everything. But his everything was like a, you know, billions of dollars, as we we're talking about, millions and millions of dollars. So he, had, he sold his beautiful home, he sold all of his other pearls, he sold his treasures to buy this one pearl. Just imagine how he would have exalted over that pearl, how he would have put it in a beautiful setting to admire it wherever he went, how he rejoiced in the beauty of the pearl. So they sort of seem like the same, same parable, don't they? But if you look at them, I actually think they're saying something different. So the first one says the kingdom is like a treasure. The second one says the kingdom is like a merchant. So the first one, the man is going about his day-to-day -day life and stumbles across a pearl. He's not a, a, a treasure. He's not searching. He's not a treasure seeker. Whereas the merchant is travelling the world looking for the pearl. The man who finds the treasure is poor. Whereas the man, who, the merchant who buys the pearl is incredibly rich, unbelievably rich, because he could buy a pearl of great price, not just an everyday pearl, a pearl of great price. The, um, the man who finds the treasure pays a fraction of the cost of the treasure. He pays a very small amount for a very valuable treasure. Whereas the merchant pays the full price, he doesn't barter it down. He doesn't try and trick them. He knows the value of the pearl and he pays the full price. So the, the man who finds the treasure, there is no real sacrifice. He gives up everything he owns, but what he gets is a million times better. Whereas the merchant sacrifices everything he has to buy this amazing pearl. So I actually think that the second parable is talking about God 
and he's seeking us out. I think the, the merchant represents God and amazingly, I think the pearl represents us. That feels a bit uncomfortable, doesn't it? Because we don't see ourselves as valuable, but God, who is the ultimate expert, says that every single one of us is worth the sacrifice of his most treasured possession. God is the ultimate expert, and when you ask what was he prepared to pay for you, he was prepared to pay the life of his son. It's unbelievable. <laughs> it, feels, it, it feels arrogant to think it, and yet this is what God says. It's easy for us to, to, to think that we're rubbish, and yet we didn't make ourselves. God is the one who made us. God, the creator of the universe, the most perfect, the most amazing, the most transcendental, you know, everything, God, 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 amazing. He handcrafted you. He knit you together in your mother's womb. And he thinks you're amazing. <laughs> and he thinks you're worth it. Um, as I said, we received a new granddaughter this week and, uh, well, received, I don't know, my daughter had a baby this week and, you know, I think she's the most amazing thing in the world, so equally amazing with my other grandchildren, of course, but, you know, she's done nothing. She just lies there and poops and wheezes and cries, but I would give my life for her. You know, she is, it, it's, she is unbelievably precious to me because she's my granddaughter so it's not saying, God isn't saying that you're perfect. He's not saying that you're without sin or any, and he's not saying be proud. But he's saying you're valuable. You're valuable because you're his. You're valuable because he made you. It's a bit like if there was this old painting in a shed covered in dust and cobwebs and, you know, you've been there for generations and, a visiting person came and looked and, and went, hang on, that's a Van Gogh. That's a Picasso. That's, a, I don't know, you know, one of these amazing artists. Even though it was dirty and covered in dust, because of the person who made it, it's valuable. So the, the expert would be willing to take that painting, to clean it up, to restore it to what it should have been. And that's what God says about us. Because he made us, because he loves us, he's prepared to invest in us. He's prepared to pay the life of his son and then he's prepared to invest every day in transforming us. It says in Corinthians, we are being transformed from one degree of glory to another. God is prepared to invest him, his whole self in making us into the image of Jesus, to the full stature of Christ. We started out being made in God's image, but... We've damaged that image, but it's still there. And God is prepared to work and invest and transform us. I love this verse. I use this in my book. Um, it's from Isaiah, and it's in the passage which starts with Jesus saying, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. So it's, it's this whole thing about the new covenant. And God is saying, God says to us, he said to the people of Israel, and he says to us, you shall be a crown of beauty in the hands of the Lord. A crown. Imagine God holding you in his hands, saying you're a crown of beauty, a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no more be termed forsaken, and your land shall no longer be called desolate, but you shall be called my delight is in her. My delight is in him. And your land marriage, your there will be a restoration of relationship for the Lord delights in you. The Lord holds you in his hand and goes, look at my girl, look at my boy. As I held my granddaughter in my arms and just went, oh, isn't she amazing? Isn't she gorgeous? She's ours. So we adore her. I didn't used to see my relationship with God this way. I had this picture that I was rubbish. And I, I like, there's truth, there's, there's this, this contrast, isn't it? There's truth. We're sinners, we're broken. But I thought that God looked at me and saw nothing but rubbish. 
there's, it's, we're told that when we become Christians, God, Jesus puts his robe of righteousness on us, which is true. And I was told that when God looked at me, he didn't look, see me, he saw Jesus. And there is truth in that. But the trouble with that was it made me see myself as this dirty sinner. I didn't think God actually fixed anything. I saw myself as this dirty sinner cowering under the robe of righteousness that Jesus gave me with Jesus standing in in front and God saying, I love you, Chris. But what he was loving was this pretend thing that I was hiding and there was this fiction that he was loving. It, it was this twisting of the truth that I am given Jesus' righteousness. God does see Jesus when he sees me, but he sees me as well. And he, there is truth. When I become a Christian, he doesn't just cover up my sin. He makes me new. He makes me into a new creation, beautiful and beloved by him. So it's a bit like the parable was the merchant went out and he bought this piece of rubbish and made every, for a million dollars or billion dollars and made everyone pretend that it was a pearl. That was kind of what I thought, that it was all pretense. So I didn't feel loved by God because I thought he was loving this pretend person over there. But the truth is that God sees every part of me. He sees the good, the bad and the ugly. And even though there's a lot of bad and ugly, he rejoices He enjoys me. He delights in me. And he delights in you as well. The cool thing about this, so because I thought I was worthless and because I thought my relationship with God was kind of pretending, it meant that I wasn't comfortable with God. I spent all my time saying, sorry, God, sorry, 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 sorry. And I didn't want particularly to be with God because I thought that he was mad at me all the time. And it also meant that I didn't have much of God to give other people because I was hiding away from him because I didn't see myself as who I was. So as God has revealed to me that I am precious, that I'm his daughter, that I'm beloved, I'm able to go into the world standing much taller. I'm able to accept the grace that he gives me and pass it on. It's not about being proud. It's not about going, here I am. God's own gift. I'm his precious pearl. It's not like that. But when you think about a gorgeous pearl, the thing that's beautiful about it is that it reflects the light. And if we can stand as God's kids, the thing that is most beautiful about us is the way that we reflect God's light into the world. I would hate it if my kids or my grandchildren just looked at me all the time going, I'm rubbish, I'm rubbish, I'm rubbish. So sorry, so sorry. I don't, I don't want them to go, I'm the best thing in the world, but I want them to know that they're valuable and loved. And God's like that as well. The other cool thing about this is knowing that I'm valuable helps me to live God, life the way that God wants me to. But knowing that you're valuable, knowing that every person that I meet is of infinite value to God is also transformative. Sometimes that's difficult, isn't it? When There's people we look at and think, I don't know how God loves them. (laughs) They're a challenging person. But every single person that you meet is an extraordinary person, someone in whom God delights. It also helps me to want to do evangelism. Because if God paid this unbelievable price for every single pearl, how awful that he doesn't get it. How awful that he pays the price and then doesn't receive every single person into his kingdom. So I think this is a really great thing to remember. You may have listened to this and thought, well, actually, I don't know if I am part of God's kingdom. God wants every one of us to be part of his kingdom. He wants everyone to become a Christian. The parable of the merchant reminds us of how Actively, God is seeking every single person in the world. And the parable of the treasure reminds us that if we want to give our lives to Jesus, what he's offering us is of infinite value. It's full of joy. The man who gave up the treasure, the man who bought the treasure, was full of joy when he gave up his old life to get the new life. And if if you're not a Christian, I encourage you to consider letting go of that old life, 
with all the, the, um, the brokenness in it and accepting the treasure that Jesus is offering you today, the treasure of forgiven sins, the treasure of shame removed, the treasure of Jesus, God himself coming to live within you. So if that's something that you would like to do today, the elders will be down the front afterwards. Um, so come and have a chat. If you made that decision, uh, the whole of heaven would be rejoicing and we would rejoice as well. So as you take communion today, I'm not sure what the topic that Ivan's talking about, but just remember, hold, as you hold that little cup and piece of wafer in your hand, it's like a check for billions of dollars that God was prepared to pay for you, that God says is your true value. 